Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Western Hunting Hub podcast. This episode is a big one for me. Uh, never really had any nerves leading up to an interview. Do a touch on this one. Wanted to kind of hit you before I did the interview here in about 10 minutes. Mr. Jim Shockey is going to be giving me a call. And I've got a nice little layout. I've got 30 minutes with him, and I am incredibly grateful for him spending his time to chat with me uh, and, and my podcast. Adrea got this set up, so big thanks to her. Jim, Mr. Jim Shockey is one of those influential leaders in the in the hunting industry that that I think just about everybody can uh, get on board with saying is is quite an influential leader a great, great human being and has done some wonderful things for hunting. So this is going to be a fun and uh, exciting interview. So I don't know quite what to expect yet other than I've listened to a few of his interviews and uh, been watching him since I was a little kid. So we'll see how this goes. Appreciate you all listening. Good morning, Mr. Jim Shockey. Hey, Clint. How's it going? I'm doing good. How are you? Uh, totally wonderful here. Sunny and looking like it's going to be a nice day for a little bit anyway. Yeah. yeah I would imagine you guys get plenty of rain, plenty of, plenty yeah, of. Yeah. Yeah. Normally, normally, and by this time the rain's gone and we, we get sunny skies just about every day for you know, for several months, at least until October, but, uh, but it looks like the rain's going to hang on for about another, I don't know, three or four days. And then, then, then it'll start. It will dry right out here. Yeah. Um, I'm in South Dakota and we, uh, we are, uh, a little drier than normal. I'm in the Black Hills area. Not too bad. We've already had a forest fire before everything greened up. So that was a little early for a pretty big fire, but, um, hopefully continued rains throughout the, the spring and summer for us. So, um, but anyway, I, I really appreciate you coming on my show cause, uh, I'm, I'm a small time podcaster and have a regular day job. So, uh, this speaks volumes of, of you. So I'm, I have a ton of gratitude for that, that, uh, you're able to come on and give me a half hour of your time. So, yeah, heck no, it's not, I mean, it's, yeah, not a problem at all. It, it, you know, my time is limited these days, but uh, but I'm happy to help out whenever I can and wherever I can. Yeah. So I want to jump right into it because I just I don't even want to talk. I just want to hear from you, <laughs> really. So, uh, yeah. but I, I've got a series of questions for you, just uh, around uh, um, is it some culture related things, some uh, kind of what's left on your bucket list what's uh um, and and so on so uh but first thing is is a kind of a hunting strategy piece that i have so my goal this year is to be a better hunter and i know that sounds really broad <laughs> really obvious for all hunters uh it's it holds true uh to so many average joe hunters just like myself who've been hunting since we were 12 or so and, uh, I'm not talking about being a better shot necessarily being stronger physically, but more so to move through the landscape with precision and stealth into where we can find success by getting in range more, more often than not. Um, I feel like sometimes as I spot a mule deer or a whitetail or whatever it is off in the distance, almost like it's going to be a stroke of luck for me to get there. I mean, I'm not a new hunter, but uh, I've got a lot of, um, I've got a 40 hour work week and so on. And, and so I'm not, I'm not in the field a ton, a ton. Uh, my new job allows me to be in the field, uh, quite a bit doing supported hunts with, with new hunters, but, uh, and that'll be a new thing for me. But what was there a moment in your hunting career that things clicked for you to take it to the next level that you were able to put stocks on animals that you just were more successful at it? Uh, you know, it, it, well, first first of all, defining success on a hunt is um, the first thing any hunter has to do. And it, you know, getting close to the animal, you know, getting the animal, that, that's not success in a hunt. Just right. being out there, the ability to, you know, 
even go hunting and, and see the animals, that's success. You know, the fresh air, the exercise, you know, the, the skills that you develop. So, so, you know, the first thing I think is really important not to put the onus on getting the animal uh, to determine whether that's a successful hunt or not, because that what it does it puts pressure, and and when there's pressure, it, it's it's more difficult for people to perform. I mean, you know, I, I golf. I can make a two foot putt, you know, in my sleep a hundred times out of a hundred, until it's a two foot putt to win the club championship. <laughs> you know, then then it's you know there's pressure. So so why did I why did I not sink the putt? And that's the exact same thing on hunting. When you, you know, I mean, you, you basically set yourself up for, for, um, not getting close to animals when you said, I've got 40 hours of work week and I've got a, I don't have so much time. I got to you know, that's pressure. So, so you have to remove that pressure. And, 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 uh, I, you know, I guess it, it sounds kind of yoga y, but, uh, you got to be in the moment, um, and, and do what's right regardless of how that, how important getting that animal might be to you. So you have to remove that importance. It's not, that's not, uh, that doesn't determine the success of a hunt. What, what, you know, what determines are all the things you were doing up to that point and the things you'll do after, whether you get the animal or not, that's success. So once you remove the pressure and, and just accept that, you know, it's not that important to kill this animal, then you'll start making decisions that are the right decisions on a, on a, on that moment, on that stock in that situation, you know, with the wind, whatever it is. And you know what? There's times you can't make the stock. There's times you can't do it. And, and, and so you didn't fail uh, on your hunt, you know, to succeed, to get the animal when you tried to make the stock It's because you, nobody could have made the stock. It was not possible. The wind was wrong. The, you know, the conditions were, imperfect the animal wasn't doing what it needed to be doing so you know, want once you to accept that there is there's no pressure to make the stock then you wait you, you be patient <clears throat> it's you know it's the reason i missed that two foot putt and to win the club championship which by the way i actually didn't uh oh, i'm not that good a golfer i came fourth but but uh the, the reason anybody misses those putts is because they they're stressed, they, they push it, they you know try too hard, you know they and they tighten up. They <clears throat> and in hunting you force the the stock, you go when you shouldn't go, and it's because you know oh if I don't get this it's you know failed hunt it's a you, you, you just wait just wait be patient it's it's amazing how many times when you're patient hunter's luck comes into play. You know, uh, who knows what a coyote goes on the other side of the, the deer and it looks at the coyote and jumps out of his bed and, and runs right towards you and looks back at the coyote and there you are within distance because you waited. If you tried to stalk in on that animal right then in those in that situation with, with the animals offering you, you, you would have blown it and scared it away. So, you know, the coyote helped you. You know, now there's hunter's luck, that, you know, bad luck too as you're being there patiently waiting the wind changes and, and uh, the buck smells you and runs away but if the situation wasn't right to sneak in on that animal you would have blown it anyway so so like i say the the, the pre- you, you sort of set yourself up for for having a a, a stock not work out when as, soon as you said that i only get so much time and and uh if you're trying to be, you're, you're trying. It's not about trying. It's about patience and waiting for the opportunity. When the opportunity is right, taking advantage of that opportunity. Maybe you have to find that animal the second day, you know. But at least you didn't blow them out of the country the first day. Yeah. Uh, and it, you know, it's a, these are these are decisions that you know. It's easy for me to say at, at this point in my career, I've done a lot of hunting, so so I, you know, I don't feel any pressure on any animal. I don't yeah. care if it's world record, whatever, you know, I, I'm enjoying the time in the moment of, and loving the, the challenge of getting close to the animal. But, you know, my world's not going to really change if I don't get that animal. I, you know, if I get to go hunting, you know, with meat, I get to go on another hunt in a week anyway, or two weeks. So, 
you know, it's easy for me to say. And, and, you know, it wasn't, wasn't that easy for me to do back when I was younger. And, uh, you know, just trying to create a career in the hunting industry, there's a lot of pressure. And, and, and I forced situations that, uh, that I should have been patient on. And, and now it's easy to look back on it in hindsight, but, uh, you know, I can't do anything about my past mistakes, but hopefully that little bit of advice will help you to avoid future mistakes. No, I think that's exactly what I needed to hear. Uh, and wanting to have success really to me is being able to, I, I've been getting better and better and better with this patience deal and, and looking at a situation and trying to assess and making a good stock and, and enjoying that entire experience for sure. Trying to focus on the, or the, the success then to me would be making improvements on a last failure. And that's what gets really enjoyable when I, learned something from the last bull that I bugled in and I messed it up because I went right instead of left and learning from that the next time and getting yet just a little closer, outsmarting that animal a little bit, a little bit more seems to be what one of those pieces that I get a lot of enjoyment out of. Oh yeah, that was awesome. That was awesome. So, um, yeah, the, the, uh, that, that's good advice. So I want to, I want to move on. Uh, Uncharted was the show of yours that that really can and, and like most connected with or uh, really enjoyed the most for sure. Uh, I uh, enjoyed uh, hunting adventures as well as as the professionals. Uh, been watching that since I was young, 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 and uh, Uncharted just was something that was nobody had ever seen. And obviously this was, it was absolutely new, uh, seeing species hunted. I didn't, we didn't even know existed. Uh, and so you've kind of gone to the far end of the world. You've seen all these hunting cultures. Uh, you've seen the hardest hunts to get to in the world and to hunt. Where did you see hunting have the greatest positive impact on people? Oh boy. I mean, you know, there's, the general population, which are, you know, they're just not affected by it one way or another. 90% of the people are not hunters. They're, you know, and, and the vast majority of those are urban dwellers. So, so they don't, you know, when you say it affects people or where hunting affected people positively, um, it, it's a pretty point specific question because, people in New York city don't care. I mean, they, they yeah. may care. They may say they care. They, they join, you know, send money to the humane society or, you know, they, you know, might say at a cocktail party, oh, that you know, the hunters killed that animal. That was terrible. Whatever. They, they, they don't really care because they're not there walking the walk. Uh, so, so hunting does not have a positive impact on most people because, as I said, they don't care. But where where I've seen it have incredible positive impacts uh, are down in in you know or, or not down, but in places where indigenous cultures, um, are, you know, I don't want to say are given control of the animals, but where the governments recognize that the indigenous peoples of that area have a right to um, benefit from the natural resource or natural renewable resource, which is wildlife. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I'm thinking Namibia, um, you know, along the Caprivi Strip. I'm not sure what they're calling it now, but, uh, you know, they, they have, Namibia is fairly well advanced in, in their outlook on wildlife. So they, they've they turned over the management of, of the wildlife in a, a tribal area to that tribe. And therefore, the, that tribe benefits from you know the economic impact of hunters coming in. Uh, so, so it's a classic case of you know imagine a, a tribal person having ten goats, and and they're really hungry. Their family's hungry, and, and the cassava crop's not ready to harvest. They can go kill a goat, but then they're going to have nine goats, or that you know that person in that tribe can go and kill an antelope, you know, maybe, maybe a blue wildebeest, and, and bring it back to his family to eat. Now, if every, you know, that's what's going to happen. Every single family 
that has 10 goats or 8 goats, whatever number is, they're going to kill a wildebeest rather than kill their own, their, you know, their own domestic um, animals because that's their wealth. You know, that's their savings account. Why would they kill one? Now, when you have everybody doing that in that area, wildlife gets decimated. You know, there's snares everywhere. They're, you know, generally they're not using firearms. Um, everything dies. It doesn't matter. Warthogs, guinea fowl, you know, giraffes, anything that's caught, caught in those snares dies. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they, they may even poison uh, ponds to kill the animal. You know, if it's a type of poison, they can still eat the meat. Because the, the wild animals are only worth the value of a hamburger. You know, that's all it is to them is, is a meat. Now, when they are benefiting from financially and economically from hunters coming in to their tribal area and paying them $1,000 you know, to the village to be able to hunt that same wildebeest, you know, it's just common sense. That they're not going to go kill that wildebeest for five dollars worth of bush meat. Right. You know, it's a thousand dollars. You know, if they get twenty hunters in there, they get twenty thousand dollars. Well, twenty thousand dollars into the tribal coffers pays for a new school. It pays for a teacher. It pays for a doctor to come by more than just once a week to look after their their health. It pays for roads. It buys a vehicle, even maybe not a good one, but it, it buys a vehicle for the village. And that's just from 20 hunters. You know, those hunters might come and, and they may take four or five animals each, different species. So, so these tribal areas in Namibia are benefiting dramatically, economically, financially from hunting. And their lives have been improved. The quality of their lives have improved because of that. And, and the net result for the wildlife, which is what hunters care about, is that there's more wildlife and these tribal you know, people are looking after these indigenous people are, are looking after the wildlife now. They're, they're stewarding over the wildlife. They don't let somebody in the village go kill one of those wildebeest because that takes $1,000 out of the communal coffer. You know? and, and really, they get the meat anyway because when a hunter comes, you know, the hunter doesn't take the meat back to North America. The, the hunter leaves it there for the village. So they not only get the benefit of the thousand dollars, they also get the meat. Mm-hmm. So they they start looking after the wildlife as if it's their own domesticated animals, you know. So the wildlife then becomes like their goats, protected, and and it, 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 you know there that's just one case. This, this is going on all over the world. Uh, the ajitos down in Mexico, same thing. You know, tribal lands, and and you know we we have in the States, even uh, White Mountain Apache Reservation, that you know, they're looking after their wildlife and doing very well at some of the best elk hunting and bear hunting to be had. So, so you know, I'm not saying it's the solution everywhere, but um, I've certainly seen hunting benefit these indigenous peoples around the world, uh, you know, greatly benefit them. And, uh, you know, I, I think if we continue down that path, there, there's going to be... Uh, you know, it'll be good for wildlife around the world and good for the cultures, the various uh, cultures around the world. Yeah. And was there a culture or group of people that it just did it for you? Like you, is there a, if you, the first one to come to your mind, <laughs> I know you've been to so many areas. Is there one that you just, I want to hang out with those people tomorrow? It was there one somewhere around the world that, that just really you connected with and you, you just love, love, love those people. Well, they're all, they're all, you know. I have great respect for all of them. Uh, right, right. Our, 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 our northern cultures, the Inuit uh, and the Inupak, I believe they call themselves their Eskimos. They, you know, in Alaska, you know, Point Hope, the whale hunt, traditional whale hunt for belugas and bowhead whales. Uh, you know, there, it's just. I mean, it's it's an uh, Ten thousand year old, depending on you know what what you believe, what faith you're part of. It, you know, it's a culture that's been living there for ten thousand years, and and some of the harshest climate imaginable, and and producing some of the greatest works of art any indigenous culture has ever produced. Uh, you know, but you know the northwest coast 
you know, First Nations people here in British Columbia. You know, the, the boy, you know, the, the sand people, the Bushmen down in Australia, the you know, the the Hamu and Kara people in Ethiopia, they're they're all wonderful cultures. Um, and and you know, for me personally, you know, their their ethnocentric art forms are are spectacular. They're hand handmade works of uh, you know folk art. Um, I mean, yeah, we, we just we just have lost all that in our in our urbanized cultures. You know, we. We're, I don't know. I don't want to say civilized because we're we're not. You know, we we're urbanized, and that's not necessarily civilized. And, and even those of us that are living in rural areas, you know, if we had to go live off the land and and uh, you know, up in the north somewhere, you know, out of Kugluktuk and, and uh, you know, the Copper Copper Mine River or Copper River, we'd we'd you would die. And, yeah. and these people survive. I mean, it's just you know, the, being with uh, the the little pygmy uh, trackers and hunters in the West African jungles. Unbelievable. I mean, they're just so adapted and so part of nature. Uh, you know, I, 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 all of the cultures, like I say, I hold in high regard, great respect, and and could only hope that maybe in another life, if I ever return, that I'd be at their at their level you know I'm, I'm unworthy is what i've learned i think with these these amazing people around the world yeah no and i didn't mean to have make you pick one or anything like that just uh uh i think it's so fascinating to dive into each or some of those that that you just think about constantly and and uh um almost emulate or wish you kind of could could live that similar life like you're saying uh just something something that anyone just about everyone in north america are so far rem- or i would maybe the u.s are just so far removed from that we are walking into our shields cabela's whatever buying our stuff and out we go hunting uh, it's just so far removed uh, it's without shows like yours diving into those cultures we wouldn't be able to see that or understand that even and we still can't i'm sure as much as in a in a 30 to hour long show uh but it's still give it giving us a portion of what you saw and experienced so that's it's helpful to try and get a grasp and and definitely a greater appreciation for for uh what it's like around the world because I've barely left the country, so. Uh, but uh, one thing I was uh, paying attention to with, um, and forgive me, one of your ibex hunts, and uh, as you were lining up the shot, and, and uh, it was behind a, a little piece of brush there, there was some sticks in the way, and and uh, you were saying, "I don't have a shot, no shot, no shot." Um, and I've heard you say that many times, no shot. I don't have the shot yet. Not going to take it. Not going to take it yet. Uh, with, with cultures that are very much sometimes a, we got to get that animal because we want to eat it. Uh, or how are you navigating some different levels of, of ethics, hunting ethics, um, where you are really, 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 and they, they too, uh, very much care about the animals, I'm sure. But, um, you want to make a very, very clean shot. And I want to connect this to maybe a hunter here in North America going hunting with a, a, a group, a, another guy, that they have some different values. And how did you navigate the conversation of, no, that's not a good shot yet. I'm going to I'm gonna wait for the better shot. And how did you navigate that conversation to, to be something that, that was respected? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the big thing about ethics is that's an individual choice and, and an individual decision. It's uh, you you can't legislate ethics. You can't tell somebody that you know it's unethical to take that shot if they think it's ethical or if they they want to. I mean, it, you know. So so I've never honestly worried about other people's ethics. That's not my problem, SCP, mm-hmm. somebody else's problem. Um, 
and 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 it's I know who I am. I know you know I, I, I'm making my own decisions. It's self determination. So if I'm the one pulling the trigger, then it, it's got to be right for me. Period. Mm-hmm. And I don't care what pressure you know my buddies might be putting on me, or I don't care what they do. That's their that's their decision. If it if it's legal to go hunting, you know, and, and to take that animal, they're licensed. The season's open. They're following all the laws. At that point, it becomes who who they are on their choice of shots. You know, they, they're deciding who they are. So it's not for me to tell them what to do. They, they they decide that themselves. Now, if I see somebody that you know has ethics that that are so far removed from my own that you know I I, I just don't want to be around them, then it's pretty simple. I, I just don't be around them. And there, you know, there's many people that that um, probably feel the same way about me that you know I, I'm. I should have taken the shot. Why didn't you take the shot right then? Why, you know, you, you've got a lot of money invested. That's just an animal, whatever. The, I, I, I don't, the, like I say, it's, I don't worry about other people's ethics and, and, and their morality. I, those kind of things, you, you might be able to legislate morality to a degree, but you can't legislate ethics. And, and so, so it's, you know, I, I like I say, if you, people, I see it all the time in today's world, People are so wound up about other people's ethics. What was their motivation for doing something? What, yeah. you know, that should be stopped. Yeah. That's that's wrong. It, you know, and they should be. They should think like me. Their ethics should be my ethics. And and uh, and and they get, like I say, really upset about this to where they're, you know, there's even the hate because someone's ethics are different. It's legal. You know, it's legal. It's it's not for you or me to tell somebody else how to do something what what you can do is set examples and educate and and try in a positive way to bring a a message that they understand to educate them about you know about why you do things the way you do and and you know this is your ethics but it doesn't make them right and nor does it make the other person's wrong you know ethics are ethics they're they're uh, no other person controls your ethics other than yourself. And, and you can be judged by other people, certainly when they look at you and say, well, that was unethical, you know, and, and if you're prepared to accept that judgment then great. And, and, you know, but don't whine about it. If, if your ethics were counter to their ethics and they comment on it, you know, be, be who you are, be, be strong in, in your own values. Um, now do I, you know, what do I think personally about people with ethics that are less than mine? I, you know, I, I have little respect for them. You know, I respect somebody that does things the right way. You know, I mean, a Fred Bear way. And I don't even know Fred Bear personally, but I never did. But, uh, you know, for all I know, he, he didn't always do things ethically that I would match my ethics, but he, he certainly now as a legend uh, in our industry, you know, it it just seems to, he speaks of ethics. I mean, the Pope and Young Club, you know, the ethics, the Boone and Crockett Club, um, you know, these are organizations that, that stand for doing things right, the right way, even if it's, you know, legal to do it a different way. So, so like I say, you, you, you uphold your ethics by example, you show people what your ethics are and um, hopefully educate them on, as to why this is the reason you do things. And, and then they, they follow suit. I, I actually see a lot more of the younger group coming up now, the hunters, uh, with, with far better, in my opinion, ethics than, you know, my father's group. Sure. Those guys. I can see that. You know, it was, uh, and, and, you know, part of it is, is the respect for the animal. My father and, and his brothers, that deer running across the field was literally just a hamburger. That's all it was, was mm-hmm. meat, you know, meat, the, just meat. You know, it, it was cheaper than buying meat and we didn't have a lot of money. So it was meat. 
um, you know, I don't see nearly as much of that anymore, um, especially in this younger group coming up. Uh, you, know, you know, just just the way they look at hunting, the fact that you're spending time listening to me blabber about it and, and sharing your podcast. I mean, that's, you know, that, that, that speaks volumes. You said earlier, you know, my actions spoke volumes, but in fact, you know, what you're doing speaks volumes to me and, and gives me hope that, uh, that messaging is definitely getting through. And, and the example that many of us, you know, of my generation tried to set, um, is, is paying off. And you guys get it. And, you know, not guys just as in males, but uh, the newer generation of hunters, they get it from what I can see. So, yeah, it gives me hope. And, and like I say, just don't worry about other people's ethics. You, you live your life and do what you know is right in your heart. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, that, that's, that's all you can do. You can't, you can't control other people's ethics. Uh, there's some really good advice there that you just gave gave me personally uh, with what I'm sharing with my podcast, but through my work and working with new hunters, uh, trying to convey this message of of ethics and the whole discussion. But definitely, I can see again that patience that we talked about earlier on what success means and leading needing some maturity there to to lead us to how we how we navigate in the field and, and how we navigate as hunters. So I, I, um, that was heard loud and clear. So I, I, I think, uh, I think I, I, I can use a lot there. So thank you. Um, what's left on your bucket list? You've hunted about everything. <laughs> what, uh, at this point in your life, um, what's, uh, what's left on the bucket list? Not meaning like a hunt, but, uh, what is it that, that connects you to the natural world that you are just wanting to go out and do? And maybe that's, um, I'm not meaning a, a specific hunt, but maybe that's, uh, your, your grandchildren or, or whatnot. What's the, what's the thing you're looking forward to next? Uh, well, it's, it's actually the, uh, the thing that I've, I've looked forward to since I was 10 years old. Uh, you know, I, I've always, wanted to be a, a writer um and i you know i've i've started novels over the years i've written a thousand articles from magazines hunting magazines and back in the day you know that's that's how i made my living I, but but i never sat down and wrote a novel um because i i felt that you know there, there's two ways you can write a novel you can you can go to school learn how to write a novel and, and then become a writer and, and write novels and you know that happens all the time and 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 you know it works for them i guess for some of them but uh for me i always felt that you had to live life first before you could actually have something to write about something to say so you know I, i've written a novel and uh it's off of the you know, various publishers in new york city right now the big guys and and we'll see if, if, if one of them bites on it although <laughs> you know the the common consensus or answer I'm getting back is, you know, we're not interested in, in male white conservative writers. Um, you know, how they know I'm you know conservative, I have no idea, but they come to that conclusion. Uh, you know, I guess they Google me and figure that out. <laughs> yeah. quick, but, uh, yeah. but, you know, I, I'm hoping that there's somebody out there that's that has enough, you know, vision that they're not, they, you know, they, they can make their own decision, not just go along with the wave of anti-white male conservative you know, uh, you know, writers. So, so we'll, we'll see what happens, but that's, you know, on a career level, that's what I'm looking forward to uh, is telling the stories that I have now to tell, you know, get them out of my head and, and do that for 10 years. So we, we, you know, hunting wise, we, you know, I, I've hunted everywhere that I've, really had any desire you know on the exploration side anyway um there's really no you know i I, four years ago i started winding it down uh we had enough hunts in the can so that in october of 2019 was my last scheduled international hunt of of, you know any 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 international hunt actually and, you know, because they're front-loaded by, the, you know, two, three years in the planning, 
um, you know, that was uh, that was in the, in the works. And, you know, then COVID hit shortly thereafter, which is fine because it didn't really. It's good uh, timing. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I had done all the traveling, you know, for me personally. You know, I feel horrible for the people that it did affect, but uh, it, it didn't stop me from doing anything I wanted to do because I'd already done it. Um, you know, that said, on the hunting side, I, I am really excited about, you know, the Yukon going up to our rogue river elephant territory and hunting moose and caribou and grizzly bear when I can every three years and and uh, sheep and, and uh, just enjoying that vast, remote wilderness for as long as I can. You know, I'm 63 now, so it's it's hard to say how long I can go. I know I guided my dad to his last moose when he was 79. Uh, so I guess there's, you know, still a chance I can do it for a few more years, God willing. Yeah. Uh, you know, on a ranch in Saskatchewan, hunting and hunting mm-hmm. white-tailed deer. I grew up hunting white-tailed deer. So to go back out there now, you know, they've changed the rules in Saskatchewan. So I can't, I have to get a draw tag on my own ranch, which is our family ranch, oh. which is kind of, you know, I mean, I get it, but it's, it's, uh, uh, you know, when you're, paying so many taxes out there and you can't can't even hunt on your own land it's like eh, wait a minute yeah. but but i get you know that's that's what the saskatchewan is very protectionist of its of its resource so, okay but yeah. but i'm looking forward to the hunting there vancouver island uh, where we live um you know going after the spring bears i was just up last week i didn't shoot anything but it's not about getting an animal it's about you know being there and hunting for that animal uh, so, so you know, that's that's really all my hunting goals. I, I might once in a while do a, um, something a little more exotic. Like, you know, I, I would like to get all of the North American big game species uh, with a muzzleloader, one of one of each, with a muzzleloader large enough to make the Boone and Crockett all-time record book. You know, that that would be. Uh, you know, I'm up to 19 now out of the. 30 species that you can hunt and, and, uh, you know, maybe I'll chip away at that for the next 10 years. I don't know, you know, not, but not, not any big panic or, or it's not a major goal. And and then there's our museum, you know, our hand of man museum here in Vancouver Island. That, uh, looks incredible. One. Yeah. It's, it's a really neat place. If anybody's up this way on Vancouver Island, um, North of Victoria, it's, 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 it's really, truly from, and I'm speaking from just listening to the people's comments that visit. And, you know, we had 91 people come through yesterday and 87 the day or 76 the day before. Yeah. They love it. And, and, and they're not hunters. They're, they're just regular people. And the museum is full of, of, uh, natural history, you know, item specimens, you know, right, right from, you know, cave bear skeletons and woolly mammoth skeletons and, and narwhal skeletons down to, uh, you know, mounted dick dicks and, and dikers from Africa, and, you know, plus all the cultural artifacts. So, so that I'm going to be busy with that, curating that for the next 10 years because there's zero government dollars and, you know, in this museum, it's, it's all, you know, we finance it, Nana Weezy and I, um, ourselves and, and, uh, We've done all the curations ourselves, the video productions in house, and and uh, you know we'll I'll get it set up and then we'll donate the whole thing, land, building contents to a foundation and set up an endowment for it. So that'll that'll keep me busy for the next ten years as well. Oh, wow. And then, like you say, there's there, there's the grandkids. Yeah. I've got four grandchildren now that are four years of age and younger, or two to four. You know, four of them. They're all, they're living in the states, so. So that's going to take up, uh, you know, some of our time now, and and uh, you know, really looking forward to that to 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 be able to spend whatever time we can. Now we live on Vancouver Island, and our grandchildren are down south, two in Kansas City, and two just outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. So, you know, it means a little bit of travel down to the states. We have our place in Pinehurst that we'll spend winters at, and. You know, last thing will be golf. I'll, I'll be working on being a, a decent super seniors golfer uh, when I turn 65, or by the time I turn 65, so that I can be competitive in, in that field. So, so you know, it's a uh, 
life is a, a wonderful thing and you only get one crack at it. And, and uh, you know, I certainly <laughs> have swung for the fences on, on the hunting, you know, that yeah. international travel and hunting that I did for 40 years. And, and there's just a time you have to slow down uh, on that and let you young guys uh, chase around the mountains. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't have anything to prove to myself whether I can do it or, or not do it and don't need to prove it anymore. So I can, you know, I can have the luxury of, of choosing what direction I want to go with my life at this point. Like I say, you get one life, so you might as well do what you want to do and, and be who you are. So that's, that's who I plan to be for the next 10 years. Of course, you know, man plans and God laughs. So we'll, we'll see if I can actually pull all those, those yep. uh, plans off. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, life is good. It's, uh, like I say, an amazing planet and such a privilege to have this one life we're all given. You know, it's, I don't want to squander even one minute of it. We have such a, a great way with words to paint a picture, and so I'm excited to see what you do with your, your writing. And then it, I kind of almost see with the museum, you coming back full circle, because I know you had started with antiques, correct? And then there's the hunting and the kind of all of those relics and pieces all coming back together in this museum. And I kind of, I took the virtual tour of it and, uh, I've never been anywhere near that area of the country or North America. So I, I'm, I, uh, I'm, I put that on my list of something I want to do someday is, is get, get there to check that out. That'd be quite a sight. Well, you won't be disappointed. I, I promise you it'll be, uh, it's it's like I say from what the comments from everybody that, that visits is you know it's overwhelming so that's uh, I take that as a good a good compliment uh, and, and there's definitely lots to see it's it's worth making the the journey up to this place to see it. Well, I really want to respect your time because, like you said, that's one thing we all only have so much of, and I'd like to ask you just one question in closing, and that's. Uh, just that I try so hard to fulfill my needs at home and do the best job I can as a father and a husband. And I try not to create any resentment for around me being a hunter and being gone. And what advice do you have for me and the rest of the listeners that are fathers and mothers of future sportsmen? Uh, it's really, really, really simple respect and communication. I mean, respect your spouses, um, you know, feelings and, and wishes. I mean, it, you know, I was gone a lot. Louise had to look after the kids uh, when I wasn't here. I mean, she dealt with it. Now, it worked for us because she wanted to focus 100% on the children. And, and uh, if I was around, she said I took up space in the house, you know, which, which, which I did. You know, she'd be, you know, with the kids all day and then they go to sleep and then I'd look at her and say, okay, my turn now. You can be with me. I, you know, I, I, I take, took more of her attention. So, you know, it, it worked for us. Um, but, but it's because I respected her feelings. And it, it, honestly, you know, to me, I, I could no more have stopped hunting than I could have stopped breathing. You know, it was that important to me in my life. And she recognized that she respected that. On the other hand, if Louise had ever said, I don't want you to hunt, you know, for I, I would have known for her to say that, that it's something really, really important. And, uh, you know, I, w- I would have stopped hunting. You know, so she knew that respect was there for her wishes and her feelings and her life. Uh, on the other hand, she knew that it's who I was, so she would never take that away from me. So, so you have this implicit understanding that y- you... Respect the other person, your, your partner, your soulmate enough to to um, never take for granted, you know their, uh, you know their their giving to you or, or their understanding of our lifestyle, of our our passion, of our of our life. Um, you just you, you always you know always respect it and and acknowledge it which is the second part of the equation is communication. Um, I phone Louise every single day that I was gone ever. Uh, I phoned her. I mean, if I didn't phone her, it was something, you know, just satellites were down, whatever, you know, something happened. 
Um, but I, I phoned her and oftentimes twice a day, I would take the time, you know, to go outside after dark when everybody's sleeping to get on the sat cell phone and, and call her and, and, and we would chat. So what happened with the kids today? What's going on? What, you know, how's, how's life? What, what are you doing? I just want to make sure you're okay. Um, you know, it, it's, it's communication just that she knew no matter where I was, I was thinking about her and, and I cared. And, and a lot of times, you know, that support, you know, Hunter, you know, we get off in the bush and mountains and we think it's about us. And, it's, you know, there's still your family back at home, your spouse that you have to think about regardless of where you are. And, and I made sure that Louise knew that I was always thinking about her. I mean, I, you know, I, I would take pictures of wildflowers. I'd hold them with a, make a little, I'd pick them and, and hold you know, a bouquet of wildflowers and, and get one of the, the cameramen to snap a picture of me with holding my finger like a heart shape over my heart. And, you know, I would give those to Louise when I got back so that even after the fact, she would know that I was thinking about her when I was there. So, so you know, that's the communication part. And, and so between respect and communication, it, it you know, it can work. I mean, and, and be very healthy and you know, Louise and I have been married 36 years. It'll be 37 here pretty quick. And, uh, and you know, we were head over heels of love back then and, and even more so now. Um, so, so it's, you know, and, and yet I traveled up to 306 days a year, actually on average for, for a decade, uh, more than a decade and 200 year, days a year before that I was on the road. Um, you know, so that that puts a strain on on any relationship, but it's a strain that can be easily relieved with with respect and uh, communication. Pretty simple. It just you know, it means you have to think about your partner, your soulmate, your spouse. Easy. Mm-hmm. No, that's a uh, that's wonderful advice. Wonderful advice. Well, uh, you, you are a man of uh, integrity and class and, and definitely a true leader. So I, I, all of those pieces that you're, you're tell, saying are being absorbed. And, and I know I've got some buddies that I told about this interview and, and they're excited to hear, hear, hear what you have to say. So you your message will be, will be shared down the road. So thank you so much for your time and I will let you get back to your Monday and, and, uh, Good luck to you with your writing uh, and the museum, and I will be there someday. Perfect, perfect. Well, we'll I'll make sure I'm there. I'll give you a personal tour. Oh, that'd be awesome. But all right, well, again, thank you for your time so much and and uh, being who you are. <laughs> Impossible to be anybody else. But, <laughs> yeah. but I, I I appreciate that. Thanks, thanks a lot. I'm happy happy to do the podcast with you. All right. Well, we'll hopefully talk to you another day. Yeah, I'll be here. All right, bye. Bye bye. Holy smokes, as Jim Shockey would say. Uh, I believe that went well. Uh, transitions could be a touch better, but that's okay. Uh, what a wonderful guy, loaded with a lot of advice, a lot of uh, thoughts that that I don't even know how to get out of my head. Uh, or even, or even ha- how to ask the questions to get to those answers uh, that that he has in his head. So, um, just very in, much an intellectual individual, and a like I said, definitely a man of integrity. Uh, I did not pay for this interview. Um, I don't know if any of you know who <laughs> I'm going to throw someone under the bus. I don't really care. I don't know if you know who uh, Elk Nut is. Uh, great i don't even know his real name um but he's he's got a a whole series and he was going to charge us to do this interview and i'm sure only a small handful of people who know who he is jim shockey did not charge us a thing drea reached out to her, him and his his uh, scheduler got a hold of us and and did uh um got this schedule to kind of have to get pushed back here and there but it worked out and he called me and did this did this uh this interview so i i definitely have a ton of respect for this man uh, i started watching a few more of his shows again just to get caught up and and just a a really unique 
uh, individual that has a career of putting together a the hunting story. And in the 90s and early 2000s, it used to be 20 kills and so along is, the, is what most of the hunting shows were like. And as he started Uncharted, it became more of the story of the people and the story of what hunting does. And, and he had a, a lot of that in previous, previous shows, but it really is, is more than just that, the, the kill. Uh, and as he talks about the, what success means and, and someone that I think we could learn from on as to how to, how to, how to live our life as a family man. Uh, and even from a guy who has gone 250 to 300 some days a year, uh, who's definitely a family man. And maybe that's what made his bond with his wife even stronger, uh, just creating and being forced to create that, that respect and communication, but also just the, the love you have for an individual. So that, that, uh, uh, was really fun to chat with him. He said, uh, personal tour of the museum. Guess I'm going. So I'll have to make that uh, something happen a little sooner than later. And can't wait to get up there and see that. So hope you guys enjoy that. Learn something from an amazing man. And uh, sorry, can't top that. That's as good as I got. Thanks for listening. Got a deed to the land, but it ain't my ground. This is God's country.